Okay, <clears throat> okay, we're back. Here we are on uh, tape three, and uh, this is a really fascinating tape because up to now, Billy's uh, experiences and contacts have pretty much all been on the planet Earth, but things are changing now. He's up to his 31st contact, which takes place on July 17, 1975. Just a couple of days before this, Simyasi has contacted Billy t uh, telepathically and uh, asked him to prepare for a surprise for a rather long mission, that she and the others have decided to take Billy to the Pleiades, and that they have some other things to do, and they're on a certain mission of their own, and they plan to take Billy with them uh, for a period of time actually amounting to several days. But they mentioned to him that he would only be gone for about 30 hours, so apparently they plan to return him, somehow kind of making some sort of time shift. So the uh, time comes, and Billy's ready. He gets uh, some extra film together and his camera, and he heads out for the uh, location. He, uh, again, is feeling the familiar telepathic uh, cooling on his forehead, receives the message from Semyasi. Here's the voices in his head, and he's off to the contact. Well, she picks him up. First of all, she's on the ground when he, uh, when he gets there. The ship is already parked, and they talk for a minute, and she explains to him what they're going to do that they're going to go for a ride and that they're going to go visit several other planets and um, ask him if he has his film with him, which he does, so she says, well, all right, let's get going. So they walk over to the where the beam ship is parked and they, uh, Billy notices once again that they, there are no steps involved or anything, they just seem to float right up into the hatch of the ship. Now the hatch is in the bottom center of the ship and they pull right up inside of the ship. Billy's got his camera ready, and before he can hardly even get oriented, the ship is already leaving the ground, and the hatch is still open. So he manages to snap a picture to in the open hatch of the ground as it's kind of racing away from them. And already they're pulling away from Earth. Well, she informs Billy that the uh, first part of their uh, trip today, that she's going to give him a, a ride to Venus and Mercury. And they're going to fly by those planets, and she has some things to show him. And uh, he says, well, will I be able to take pictures this time? And she says, yeah. Now, we know the difficulty quite sometimes that your camera has inside of the ship and that you have focusing that little camera. So they had um, designed something for him to help take the pictures so he wouldn't have to take them through the... Uh, the sight screen, the little board windows they call them on the ship, which sometimes are in different colors because of the atmosphere, the radiation outside, and mess the pictures up. Uh, Billy, as a matter of fact, snaps a couple of pictures as they're leaving uh, planet Earth on that day, and they come out kind of green, just like um, the the uh, she said they would, because the board windows reflect green uh, in our atmosphere. They're orange on the outside, and as the light comes through them, it appears green on the inside. So. Whenever he takes pictures inside out through the window in an atmosphere, he gets this green thing. There are a couple of uh, pictures in his collection. Uh, you can see the uh, ship in front of him as they pull him out of Earth, and there's another one far out in front. So there's all three of them leaving that particular day. Well, they made for him something, a special screen for photographing. And Billy said it looked like a plain, uh, just a sheet of glass, almost, with kind of a border around it. And she says, well, this will allow you to get pictures uh, on the surface of the planet and other areas without taking the pictures through uh, the windows of the ship, which doesn't always work well. So Billy looked at the glass and held it in his hands, and he uh, said it was about 50 centimeters square. And uh, when he looked at the glass, you could see outside uh, the ship. It apparently somehow had the ability to, wherever you kind of aimed the glass, it would see outside the ship something much like a video camera mounted on the outside of the ship might show up on a television screen. So he said, uh, well, how do I work this? And she says, well, there's really nothing to do. You can just aim your camera at this uh, little screen, this plate of glass, and take a picture of whatever's on the plate. And that should allow you to get uh, a little better picture. So he's kind of uh, fiddling with that and looking around the ship, and they're on their way to Venus, which it isn't going to take very long to get there. He's noticing all around the ship, and it's circular inside, that there are all sorts of instruments and screens and uh, <clears throat> all over the ship. The middle of the ship, there's kind of a round table that has a lot of instruments on that. And over on the, um, I guess you call it the console, where she actually controls the ship, 
there's a lot of different screens there, but he notices that they're quite different than like our television screens, which are normally flat, just one-dimensional things, that the screens inside of the ship seem to be kind of like holograms or some sort of 3D effect. That when you look at the picture on the screen, you don't get the effect of looking at a screen. It actually, <clears throat> excuse me, almost looks uh, like you're looking at the real thing. So they're already arriving at Venus, and uh, she apparently slows the ship down, and he takes a couple of pictures on his little side screen of the planet as they're approaching it. Then she uh, cautions him and says that they're going to fly down on the surface of the planet now, but he won't be able to use the screen that they've made for him for photographing, which is kind of curious. And he says, why? He says, well, it also picks its heat sensitive, and that the planet uh, Venus is very hot, in some parts it's up to 500 degrees Celsius uh, on the surface temperature, and that this screen somehow is affected by heat. It can uh, sense cold and withstand cold very well, but it doesn't withstand heat very well. So he wouldn't be able to use this screen for these particular pictures of Venus, although he can use them for pictures in the rest of the, of the mission, uh, the flight. But uh, so here he has to go over and he takes pictures of Venus uh, on the uh, sight screens, these 3D or hologram screens, whatever they are inside of the ship. They proceed to lower the uh, craft down, the beam ship lowers down in the clouds because Venus is covered with a cloud bank. And Billy uh, kind of notices how long it takes to slowly sink down through the clouds. When they finally come out into open air where they can see the planet, he... Um, is told by Samyasi that they're about 40 kilometers still above uh, the surface of Venus. He notices right away it uh, looks just like our moon. It's just craters and kind of a sandy, rocky-looking desert sort of thing, just kind of like the way we see the moon. And this is the same way that Samyasi had told him that it would be, that it really looks just like our moon with a cloud bank all around it. Uh, he notices that... Um, <clears throat> The surface of Venus is kind of very flat, uh, just like she said, around the equator. It's kind of smooth. And he says, well, I'd be able to take pictures of other parts of Venus. And she said, sure, that's just exactly what she had in mind. And she immediately, the beam ship, just starts skimming over the surface of Venus. And they circle Venus three, four times, something like that. And Billy's snapping several pictures as they go. Then immediately the beam ship just snaps out into space. And within a few minutes, they uh, rush right over to the planet Mercury. And it says in the notes that nothing really eventful happened there. Uh, he just snaps a couple of pictures of Mercury, and they're off back out into the free space. It mentions in the notes that they also fly by Jupiter and Saturn, uh, which Billy had been to before and already taken a couple of pictures, which didn't come out. So he's able to snap a couple of others. And again, he asks if there's any life forms of any types on these planet, and she remarks, no, there are not. However, there are ETs that have bases on some of the moons. And she didn't uh, elaborate on which ones or what they were doing there, but says that uh, on some of the moons, which are actually solid ground uh, little planet sort of things, that they have equipment there, and that they and other ETs uh, do use that. But other than... Other than that, there are no living species there, there are no civilizations there, there are no spirit form life there either. There's no intelligent life of any kind living on Jupiter or Saturn. They're not even real planets, they're just gaseous balls. Okay, Very uh, uh, uninhabitable sort of place, so it would make sense that you know, no living creature with any intelligence would want to be there, and for what possible reason. Well, after doing that, they immediately shoot back into the space right around the planet Earth, and Billy's watching on the screens, and he's surprised to see that he sees a little Russian capsule. And he looks closely out there, and he sees the initials uh, CCCR on the, the back of the capsule. And she explains to him that this is the Russian uh, space capsule that has been shot up into space.